Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be talking about aggregate demand. If after watching this video you still need a little more help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and pick up the Total Review Booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. Let's get into the content. So first of all, we need to know what aggregate demand is. Aggregate demand is the demand for all goods and services within the entire economy. If you remember back from unit one, we had demand curves for individual products. Now we have the demand curve for all products in the entire economy. When we graph it out, we're going to have the price level on that y-axis, and on the x-axis, we're going to have real GDP. Real GDP is also national income, real output, and employment correlates to the amount of output. More output, more people with jobs. Less output, fewer people with jobs, and higher unemployment. When we plot out that aggregate demand curve, it's going to be downward sloping and it will be labeled AD for aggregate demand. And for every point on that graph, we will get a given amount of real GDP for a particular price level. And since that curve is downward sloping, it means we have an inverse relationship between the price level and the amount of real GDP that will be demanded. At high price levels, we have low quantities of real GDP, and at low price levels, we have higher quantities of real GDP. Now next we're going to talk about the three reasons why the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping. The first one is called the wealth effect. The wealth effect is similar to the income effect that you may have learned about in micro. Essentially it tells us that when price levels rise, your wealth buys fewer goods and services. And as a result, real GDP decreases when price levels rise. And that's why when we graph it out, when the price level increases, real GDP decreases. And when price levels fall, your wealth buys more goods and services. And as a result, at lower price levels, we see a greater amount of real GDP. The second reason for the downward sloping aggregate demand curve is the interest rate effect. The interest rate effect tells us that at higher price levels, nominal interest will also be higher. And that means gross investment decreases. When businesses buy physical capital, they have to pay the nominal interest rate. And when price levels rise, the nominal interest rate is going to increase. And that means less physical capital will be purchased. And that's because it's more expensive to borrow when interest rates are higher. And when the price level falls, nominal interest rates will also fall. And that decreased interest rate means that businesses are going to buy more physical capital. That means more investment, increasing our real GDP output. The third and final reason why aggregate demand curves are downward sloping is called the net export effect. Remember, net exports are part of our real GDP formula. So when price levels rise, it means our domestic goods are going to be more expensive. That means foreign consumers buy less US-made goods and domestic consumers buy more foreign-made goods. And so when those price levels rise, exports are going to decrease and imports will increase. As a result, net exports decreases. And when the price level falls, foreign consumers are going to buy more of our goods and domestic consumers will buy fewer imports. That means imports are going to decrease and exports will increase. As a result, net exports increases. Next, we're going to talk about the difference between a shift of the aggregate demand curve and movement along the aggregate demand curve. When there is movement along the aggregate demand curve, it means that we have had a change in the price level and that change in the price level changes the quantity of real GDP. And that change is caused by one of the three reasons we just learned about, the wealth effect, the interest rate effect, and the net export effect. If we have a change in the price level, it means we've had inflation or deflation, and that can be measured as a change in the CPI or a change in the GDP deflator. But if there's a decrease in the price level, it will cause movement down that aggregate demand curve, causing an increase in real GDP output. This is the same thing you learned about demand curves before, where we have a difference between the change in quantity demanded and a change in demand. Only a change in aggregate demand actually shifts the entire curve. So this is a change in the price level that causes a change in the quantity of real GDP demanded. And if that price level increases, we will see a decrease in the quantity of real GDP demanded. Now the aggregate demand curve can shift, and when it does shift, it will be caused by a change in one of the components of the output expenditure formula of GDP. Remember that formula is C plus I sub G plus G plus XN. There we have our aggregate demand curve, and an increase in aggregate demand is shown as a rightward shift, just like what we had for demand curves. And a decrease in any one of those components will cause a leftward shift of the aggregate demand curve. 
So if there's a change in the price level, it only causes movement along the aggregate demand curve. If one of the components of GDP changes for a reason besides the price level, then the whole curve shifts. Next, we're going to talk about what those aggregate demand curve shifters are. The first one is consumer spending. That is the C in the output expenditure formula for GDP. If there's an increase in consumer confidence, an increase in disposable income for households, or an increase in transfer payments, or we could have a decrease in taxes, any of those things are going to shift that aggregate demand curve to the right because of an increase in consumer spending. If we have a decrease in consumer confidence, a decrease in disposable income, a decrease in transfer payments, or an increase in government taxes, that would decrease the aggregate demand curve, shifting it to the left because of a decrease in consumer spending. Next, we have gross investment. If we have an increase in business confidence, businesses are investing more, or there's a decrease in interest rates, which causes an increase in investment, then we will see a rightward shift of that aggregate demand curve because of an increase in gross investment. If we see a decrease in business confidence, a decrease in investment for some other reason, or an increase in interest rates, which causes a decrease in investment, that will shift our aggregate demand curve to the left because of a decrease in gross investment. Next aggregate demand curve shifter is government purchases. If the government buys more goods and services, it's going to shift the aggregate demand curve to the right. And if the government buys fewer goods and services, it will shift that aggregate demand curve to the left. Our fourth aggregate demand shifter is net exports. Remember, net exports is exports minus imports. So an increase in exports will be an increase in net exports, but an increase in imports will actually decrease net exports. The amount of imports and exports is impacted by tastes and preferences, both foreign and domestic, price levels within our country and the price levels of other countries, as well as our national income and foreign national income, and finally, exchange rates. And you'll learn more about these in unit six. But if there's an increase in net exports, that's going to shift our aggregate demand curve to the right. And if there's a decrease in net exports, it will shift our aggregate demand curve to the left. And there you have it. That is an introduction to aggregate demand. We're gonna go deeper with aggregate demand in future units though. If you think you're ready to practice, make sure you watch the aggregate supply video first and play the aggregate demand, aggregate supply, shift versus movement along the curve game. If you still need more help after that, pick up the total review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. That's it for now. I'll see y'all next time.